Well, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to call our regular November board meeting to order. The first item we have is adoption of the agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve it as presented. So moved. Is there a second? All right, moved by Mr. Miglarino, seconded by Ms. Wiley. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. We'll proceed with the agenda. All right, I would like to call on Ms. Molina, our CINI specialist, to lead us in the pledge, and that will be followed by a moment of silence. Would everyone please stand? <clears throat> On to item number five. The minutes were sent out. Is there any um, any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, I would uh, request the minutes be approved as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Mr. K. Seconded by Mr. Ramirez. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, item number six. Um, this is November, and uh, Veterans Day is coming up on Friday. I would just like to read our names of our West Mech staff that have served um, our country. In the Air Force, we have Bob Spoon, James Urban, Jay McDowell, Matthew Heath, Matt Still, Michael Kozensky, Robert Chambers, and Troy, uh, Troy Gabaldon. Serving in the Army, Aaron Parsons, Kim Canada, Michael Hawkins. Serving in the Marines, Richard Jones, Lorenzo Coffey. Serving in the National Guard, Charlie Ellis and Patrick Clausen. And serving in the Navy, Bruce Wil Wilson, Darwin Blackmore, Paul Getz, and Ricky Timmons. On behalf of the whole staff, thank you all for your service. All right, moving on to item number seven, summary of current events. Dr. Spurgeon, would you like to say anything? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Strachan, board, governing board members. Had some pretty exciting meetings uh, since we last uh, worked together in October. Uh, one of the things I was excited about, we uh, offered the opportunity for the Jobs for American graduates, our Jack uh, West Valley folks, to come in to tour one of our campuses as a, as a recruiting piece uh, for in, uh, ensuring that we get as many students as we can onto our campuses. And, and oftentimes, many of those students that uh, we were speaking of may not necessarily have all the opportunities that they may necessarily need. So great conversation with them as a part of our recruiting efforts to show them what we had to offer through CT programs at Westmac. Uh, secondly, uh, we had uh, a, a meeting on the Southwest campus with uh, Chief Nuclear Officer Adam Heflin, and he's the new Chief Nuclear Officer, and so we got the, our partnership back reignited again uh, with Palo Verde uh, and some things that we're going to do collectively together to keep that en energy and engineering program uh, running. Uh, we have a pump station and a control station out there that that's, uh, has been inoperable and in some ways, and so we've, we've agreed that we're going to get that back up and running again and uh, start that partnership like we had pre-COVID. And so that was a great conversation uh, with uh, Chief Adam Heflin. We had a number of open house events uh, throughout the district. I was excited to participate uh, in our Precision Manufacturing Month celebration at our central campus, which was fantastic and well attended. Uh, I've had a number of member district visits. 
uh, Mark Islis from Agua Fria took me around the district and showed me from one end to the other uh, in all of his high schools. Uh, so that was a great visit. I attended the Deer Valley Career Expo, which was done very well. They had to open two sites this year. Uh, they have a, an innovation center, and then they also have the uh, board office itself. And so they had both sites uh, completely filled with CTE opportunities and uh, uh, great events and activities. Um, something else that was really uh, very, we just recently did, um, I've never been on Ottawa University's campus. And so uh, we toured Ottawa University's campus uh, with Dr. Tyner uh, and the City of Surprise. And so we got a chance to tour their campus and then we brought them over to tour our Northwest campus looking at uh, ways in which we can partner with Ottawa University's City of Surprise and also the Northwest campus. And so needless to say, uh, as they were able to look at our facilities on the Northwest campus, they were very impressed. And uh, you really don't know what's inside the building until you get in there. And so it was a great, great opportunity for us to be able to talk about collaborations and partnerships. And what I really was appreciative of is, is how well Ottawa and the City Surprise work, work so well together and how, how much they partner with one another and share facilities and spaces, and things like that for each of their employees, which was fantastic. I uh, got a chance to tour Tolleson High School and met with uh, the Tolleson superintendent and her CTE team. Um, had our second meeting with Parker and Sons regarding the HDAC position and the model uh, for us to be able to deliver, continue to deliver um, high school and parent uh, HVAC training. Uh, so we're moving in that direction, which we think is going to be great. Uh, secondarily, in that conversation, if I've heard we need plumbers once, I've heard it multiple times. And so we started a second conversation with Parker and Sons about the possibility of them helping us in a partnership with doing something in, the, in regards to plumbing. And so they could really use that. Uh, we had our, our final meeting with the uh, Universal Technology Institute uh, regarding our automotive program, and uh, we've looked over their, their proposal and contract, and that, that's gone through the attorney and back to them, and uh, I signed that yesterday, which ensures that our Westmac students who complete that two-year automotive program are guaranteed specific aspects of their program, including the reduction of fees, some waiving of some programs, and they also have the ability to test out of any program that our student can test out of, and if they test out of it, it doesn't cost them anything. So we're looking at uh, program cost, uh, if you didn't have any reductions, we've got $49,000, and we've whittled that down to a student could get down to around the $22,000, $23,000 range. And that doesn't include them testing out of some additional courses. And so we think it's a contract that nobody else has, and uh, we're very proud to be able to offer this to our students. The students don't have to go there. It's just another one more opportunity for us to have a partnership that opens up that door because cost has always been an issue with UTI. So that's uh, with UTI. Uh, I've attended uh, conferences since we last met, the ABEC conference, which was virtual. I just finished up the ACOVA conference in Prescott uh, this past week, and I also attended the ASA Fall Leadership Conference in Tucson. And the last thing I'll end with, this was my first career uh, construction career day that I attended, and this was the largest number of businesses and vendors that were actually attending that day, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the, the, the collaboration and cooperation that you see in Phoenix is unlike any I've ever seen before. And so it was a great, we got to be, be a part of the VIP tent. I got a chance to hear some great speeches, got a chance to meet a lot of really great people and it just people that have a real heart for the, the career uh, and, and uh, work development uh, aspects of what's going on in West Phoenix. So just very excited about that. And I guess lastly, I say, since we don't meet again until December, I, I just want to wish everyone a safe and happy Thanksgiving break. So. Any updates? Okay. Uh, two weeks ago uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, the National FFA Convention happens. Uh, almost all of the CTSOs do their thing in the summer, but because of its agrarian roots, uh, FFA has always done it after the harvest season is over, so, so that's in October. Um, uh, the National FFA has, uh, we, ha we have students, uh, we don't have any central program students, all of ours are in the uh, satellite programs, but students from all of our uh, satellite programs went to national convention. They received bronzes and silvers and a couple golds in their various contests. That'll all get rolled out shortly. Um, 68,000 people were at the conference. It's the largest student conference of its kind in the world, and there are now over 850,000 FFA members worldwide, so, well, nationwide. Um, also, uh, I'm pretty sure students from just about every one of our satellite programs made it to the construction and career days. At least every school in the POSD district went, I'm, I guess most every, everyone else did. It's a pretty good time. Lots of kids get turned on by that. Uh, excited about possibilities and futures and 
and that kind of stuff. So thank you to Westmec for sponsoring that for other programs and schools and, and opportunities for kids. So that's it. Anyone else? Yeah, I got to um, attend uh, Experience Orange, I think a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that was a great event. And um, got to meet one of uh, Westmec's alumni, student that went through the, our coding program and got to see how that program influenced uh, also his cousin, I think, is now currently in the coding program, and his sister is uh, trying to get into the program. We're working toward that. So it's nice to see how the positive impact that that's had on, not just on his life, but also his family and, and uh, cousins and stuff like that. And uh, learned a little bit about uh, Project Search. I think that's what it is. And then... Uh, Afterward, I saw a post by, I think Chris put that up there, and I saw Shelly, she did a fantastic job giving an overview and, <coughs> and some insight into our program with uh, Channel 10 News. That was great to see. You did really good. Uh, and I reposted it on my Instagram, as Chris uh, recommended that we do, to help with the, uh, the, the uh, visibility of Westmec. And then I also attended uh, Westmec Alliance's um, uh, the fundraiser. Oh. Uh, top golf, yeah. I did really bad, but I hope West Mac Alliance did really well raising funds. So, uh, yeah, great experience overall. I attended a couple of open houses with one of my nieces, who is probably going to make application. Nice. It was great. All the students run that. Tell you about it. It's good. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all. Moving on to item number eight, the consent agenda. Um, is there anything anybody would like to pull? Hearing nothing, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move we approve the consent agenda <coughs> as presented. And we'll that. All right. Been moved by Mr. Marino, seconded by Dr. Pingarelli. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. It passes. Moving on to item number nine. <coughs> Call to the public. Would anyone from the public like to address the board? One more time. Anyone would like to address the board? Don't all rush D at once. All right. Since no one has come forward, we'll move on to number 10. Mr. C.J. Williams. Legislative update. Good afternoon, Chairman Straka, members of the board, Superintendent Spurgeon. Thank you for the opportunity once again to provide an update on items legislative and business development partnerships. Um, I know we've got a full agenda, so I'll get through it as quick as possible, but we've got a lot of ground to cover. I'll start with uh, the headline. We're approaching the 21st hour of vote tabulation in the midterm election. So um, I uh, shared with family and friends yesterday that asked about it. I said, don't even look until Friday unless you're, you're ready for the, the ride that this is going to be over the next couple of days. Um, and this has really been the case for a couple of reasons. We have seen in this election a significantly higher Republican day of voter turnout. Um, uh, so those that um, kind of forego the early ballot and mail-in ballot option and showed up at the polls or one of the voting centers on election day. We also saw a higher than normal late early ballot drop off. So those that did receive their mail-in ballot completed it, sealed it, signed it, but opted to turn it in at one of the voting centers day of election. Um, and then another factor that could see this go into beyond this week is the legislation that uh, adjusted the threshold from a one-tenth of one percent would automatically trigger a recount to a half a percent. And we are seeing we've got some close races um, I was at the Capitol earlier today for an unrelated meeting and uh, took advantage of the opportunity to talk to a couple of our state leaders from both sides of the aisle, and I think it's largely agreed um, with the, depending on who you talk to, some say about 400,000 to 500,000 votes still to be counted. 
um, in Arizona, and um, it's largely agreed that those will um, lean Republican as those come in, again, because of some of the factors that I mentioned above. So this could change some of the races that I'm going to uh, touch on here in just a minute. The last large batch of votes were dropped in the early, early hours of this morning. No, no big batches have dropped throughout the day. I'm hearing that there's probably going to be another big batch in about an hour um, that will update these, these races. So just of note, um, federal race, U.S. Senate, Democrat uh, candidate Mark Kelly is ahead by about four points. State races, Governor, Democrat uh, candidate Katie Hobbs leads by two-tenths of one percent. Um, Secretary of State, Democrat candidate Adrian Fontes leads by about four points. Attorney General, Republican candidate Abe Hamaday leads by about two-tenths of one percent. State Treasurer Kimberly Yee is probably the only one feeling comfortable right now, um, and she leads by about 12 points. And Superintendent of Public Instruction, Republican candidate Tom Horn leads by about 1%. So um, close races, and again, those four to 500,000 votes yet to be counted could certainly impact those over the next um, couple of days. West Mech specific races, I should say um, in relation to the state races, because I've got the floor and she's my representative at the Capitol, I want to congratulate Representative Beverly Pingrelli, who often joins us and I consider to be part of the West Meg family on her decisive re-election for District 28. So congratulations if she's in here. She was in here before, but if you would pass that along. I will, thank you. Thank you. West Meg specific races um, will be welcoming some new board members to start their term in January. Linda Busom representing District 2, and likely Robert Garcia um, representing District 5. Um, also of note, uh, the Nataberg community um, were presented with the question of whether or not to join West Mech as a CTED and um, overwhelmingly said yes, with 72% of the vote being in favor of joining West Mech um, CTED. I had the privilege last week of providing the legislative update at the Falakova conference and um, went through uh, some history and some current legislation, but really what I hope landed with the attendees is the importance of connecting with your state representatives and state leaders, that they're human beings um, and uh, that it's important to build those relationships and to be informed and to engage them in um, all things CTE that we do so that they can experience those firsthand and, and make their own decisions about laws that impact CTE and career and technical education districts. Um, and not just have uh, decisions be informed off of perception or um, other people's experiences. So um, encourage those attending that conference to stay engaged and build those relationships. Kind of quasi-legislation, um, WestMEC uh, submitted an application last week uh, for A for Arizona. It's a transportation modernization <laughs> grant. Um, we submitted an application for $1.9 million that would allow us to pilot some transportation options for students to be able to get to our central campuses. We know um, that there is a population of students that would benefit from attending one of our central programs that are not able to because they don't have the means to get to us. So we have, in, in certain cases, partnered with member districts to um, get small numbers of students to and from their home high school to the central campus, but by and large, we've not figured this out yet. So um, really, I think attaching itself to the, the interest in school choice in Arizona, this transportation modernization grant um, has been made available. Westmec submitted an application for it. Um, we would partner through this pilot with an organization called Hop Skip Drive. It's kind of a rideshare option, kind of an Uber for schools. Um, the drivers are background checked, fingerprint clearance card. Um, uh, it's got geo tracking so the parent and the school knows when and where the student is at all times. So it's got some neat features. It's really built out. We had a conversation, um, Dr. Spurgeon and I and, and Mr. Welch with Tolleson Union High School District. They currently use Hop Skip Drive uh, to meet the transportation needs of about 300 students a day. Um, and it's working well for them. So we look forward, we should know by the end of the calendar year on whether or not we'll be awarded those funds. And CJ, what's the cost of that? 
the grant? The ride. Tell them, oh. tell them about the ride. The ride is, I think it's two, what did we hear? Two dollars? Yeah, seventeen dollars, and they pay fifteen, and so it's two dollars each way. And they have the multiple students. sites that are actually already outlined for where the students can start and where they can actually end. I think they all start with the high school, but it costs the students two dollars each way. Is this done in a car, or do they have a bus? It's a vehicle, so it's a four passenger, at minimum, a four passenger vehicle. It's like a van. Or yep, yep. So there are cases where that cost could even be reduced if there's multiple students traveling from one home high school to a central campus in the same vehicle and back. Uh, but it provides that flexibility that would be needed to um, cover West Mex footprint and the many high schools that we pull from, charter schools, homeschool students, really any student that faces the barrier of transportation to get to a central program. Um, I, I want to thank the board for um, approving and allowing Jared Guy and myself to attend the Nashville Academy study. It was a very informative trip um, in partnership with the Iowa Free High School District. Um, and what really spoke to me was uh, this is an established model across Metro Nashville Public Schools where you've got strong community and business partner engagement supporting these um, career academies in all of the public schools in, in Nashville. Um, it's about a 15-year established model. They're on their second iteration, um, exploring their third iteration of that. So that's what I feel was their strength, was really the buy-in of the business community and the support in those academies. But what also stood out to me was um, just how unique Westmec is in that our programs all lead to an industry-recognized credential. Nashville's model is really career exploration. Um, uh, not necessarily resulting in that industry recognized credential, but Westmec, sometimes we get complacent and we take for granted the cool things that we've got in place by the work of many, but um, it really is unique that our programs lead to those credentials, giving students options to go right to work or and or pursue post-secondary programs. Um, lastly, I touched um, last month on our strategic partnership model and the work being done around that with uh, identifying those partnership principles and defining impressions, engagement, and strategic partnerships. And we've been applying that model to revisiting existing agreements, as well as applying it to new conversations that we're having with business partners. Um, and uh, of note, if you get or read the Phoenix Business Journal, Dr. Spurgeon's got an article in there um, on the value of these partnerships and how critical it is uh, for career technical education. So with that, I stand for, oh, I have to also say and remind that we've got the Legislative Forum next Thursday, November 17th, 8.30 to 10 a.m. It's a virtual event. If you'd like a link, um, your best contact is Joel Wakefield because he's got the registration link for that. That way we could keep track of board member attendance in case we need to provide public notice for that. But um, it's uh, really aimed at providing like a CTE, CTED 101 for uh, state leaders, legislators, policy advisors, and we're looking forward to the agenda that includes student, ex their student testimony, parent testimony, as well as um, two partners to Westmec, um, Scott Holman, who is the head of HR for TSMC, and um, Brett Galley, who is the director of legislative affairs for the Arizona Commerce Authority. So we're looking forward to that event. With that, I'd, I'd stand for any questions. A question. I think uh, I think I heard you say something about post secondary. You mean like technical programs, certification programs after high school? Anything after high school. So it could be community college, di district, a vocational program, university, any any post secondary associate's degree or advanced certification. Do we host uh, this Westmont host a sort of uh, like a college fair day, but with uh, for technical programs, recruiters to come to campus talk to our students about their programs and how to apply and all that scholarships are. Is Marilyn in the house? I am in the okay. house. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear the question? I have said it. Looking at it. I okay. caught her. We caught her. <laughs> so the question is, do we host any um, college or post-secondary fairs for our students so that they know those programs that are available to them post-West Bank? 
So we have a program through the good work of our counselors. It's called Jumpstart to College and Career through CTE. And so that's something that happens in every classroom in all of our, um, on our campuses. And it's a virtual kind of career fair that happens. Um, we don't have any um, standalone that goes on, but through our early college programs, we have a lot of community colleges and university folks coming and talking to our kids as they're designing that pathway for themselves to get into the program. So on their own home campuses, there's lots of college and career fairs. We go to that, we go to them. So mm. when Dysert holds their big college and career fair, Westmex there as one of the one of the tables. But our students, of course, are students of Dysert High School, so they're going to that career fair in that world right there. So okay. kids are getting that through different avenues. Okay. Are they? Um, is anybody focusing just on the career technical programs like? Uh, electrical journeyman or plumbing or anything. Yeah, they're, they're there as a, you know, like we used to have um, one of the construction um, companies that would partner up with Maya and come along with us and both Palo Verde used to do that and then there was a construction company, I'm forgetting the name. Anyway, um, but they used to come along with us when that happened but at a lot of the career fairs, I remember when I would go to the Agua Fria one, there would be just small businesses, there would be schools, and then there would be other schools, UTI, IBEW, just depending on who was running that career fair and how it was coming to be. But through both Peoria and Glendale, they have um, career center specialists that run those kinds of um, small career fairs on their own campuses as well. And then some are, are Within the program, there's been articulation for a post-secondary option or an apprenticeship option. Um, I know in, in healthcare, we've got articulation with Pima Medical. So PMI through our own, oh, through Westmec. So Westmec has their own um, embedded advisor, for the lack of a better term that we like, there, at Texas Virgin. So PMI, that, that young lady is with us for the past three years. We had two, we now have one. They're on a hiring freeze. But they go and they work with our veterinary science, our medical assistant, Stacy's here today, she probably can chat with you a little bit about that. So that articulated credit that they're getting because they're in Westmec goes right into PMI <coughs> and Sperontocles has data and later in the year we'll have Speranto come and do a post-secondary early college presentation for you with all of that. So Mr. Lewis, for an example, you know, we produced over 5,000 certifications for our students last year alone. The number we don't look at too often was we also had students that achieved 3,575 college credits That's right. between the 21-22 school year. So if that kind of answers your question about how much students know about the post-secondary studies and what pathways and classes that they're articulating will lead to or could potentially lead to. So it's kind of in a roundabout kind of way, but our students are very well versed in those post-secondary studies particularly if they're really interested to stay in a chosen career path. No. So real quickly, there are four ways, like through dual enrollment, that means they're being taught by our teacher and they're getting college credit by sitting in the high school class. There's concurrent enrollment, like our fire science and EMT and culinary kids that go to the community college and Westmec pays for that. And then there's this articulation that we were kind of chatting about with PMI and, um, and we have some other companies and then there's PLA, which is prior learning assessment. So our esthetician and our welding and our hairstyling are now getting credits from prior learning and being able to take that right to the community college with no cost to the student as well. So these are these early college pathways that we are, you know, we're pretty far along the road. Like you can go on our website, click on early college and see all of those paths. They got too big for our information sheets. They have their own information sheets now. There's so much going on with that. And then the kids are taking dual at their own campus. So like they might be taking dual with us, but then on their campus at Dicer, they're taking English 101 or Math 156. And so they're getting closer to that associate's degree or they're in an ACE program, or they're in hoops of learning. So there are all of these partnerships with the colleges that we have that kids are getting those credits for. And I promise to bring you that with Speranza very soon. Okay. I knew you'd want to respond to that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's so, what happens. In, in I'm leaving for Texas tomorrow, so I was checking my flight. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, in short, and it's, it's long been a myth that we've had to dispel that CTE is an opt-out of college, and it couldn't be further from the truth. We, we have proven that across all of our programs, the work of student services and others. If anything, it advances you toward those, those opportunities, so. Mr. Ramirez, that's one of the clubs. Go ahead, sir. I would just like to see us build on that, you know, <coughs> that it's not in, you know, what kind of things besides what was, can we do in our everyday life at the campuses to let people know it's not an opt-out of college right. deal. Yeah. When I talk to folks, you know, they often say, well, I didn't know that. What's it, is it 70 or 80 percent of our kids go to college? It's around 65. 65. Yeah. I throw that number out there and they're mystified. So I think we need to use it and get rid of the stigma. Yeah. And many of our students actually start our program not thinking they're going to go into post-secondary studies, but because they see some great success and build that confidence, then they decide to go on and finish their, their post-secondary mm -hmm. studies and or achieve that next level certification or degree. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, uh, they're innovative, they're creative. We've got, as I heard from, I think Ms. Medina shared that we've got some students that have, are going through the esthetician program, not necessarily planning on making a full career out of that, but to use that as um, kind of a bridge to be able to pay for their post-secondary education so that they can then pursue the career that they would like. Hairstyling as well. Some yeah. of our guys and gals will get their own chair, yeah. and they'll they'll pay them, them their way through college. Yeah, that, that's been the history of CTE. All of our students that go to college, they get they get better better paying, right, career things mm -hmm. while they're in college, right? Instead of instead of the menial minimum wage job, they're they're managing things, they're operating things, they're working. We had one kid who did all of our nursery management stuff. He was at U of A. He got to work in a, in a nursery, and he got to pick his hours. So all he had to do was 30 hours a week, do what he had to do for his plants. If he went in at 2 in the morning, because that's when his schedule was good, then he did it. If he could do it in the afternoon, he was and he got he was getting paid 15 bucks an hour. That was 10 years ago. Which, that was stupid money for just a menial job versus all of his classmates that are doing... You know, that we're, yeah. you know, in whatever food restaurant, service. food service, working on campus, doing menial stuff and, and not related to their career or anything. So so all all CTE helps kids, whether they're going to college or not. It's, it's CTE and, not CTE or. Amen. I do have one comment, uh, if everybody's done. On the election, I can tell you, my family got dropped off of the early vote list because we changed our address. And my guess is anybody who moved in the last two years got dropped off the early vote. And if you have a chance to give feedback to them, I can I could give you a lot of feedback about yeah. my two and a half hours waiting in line to vote. But we'll move that on to another time. Well, I can give you six or seven reports that everybody's calling. I mean, it's crazy. It was just insane. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're anyway, so that but they should check that. Yeah. Thank you. If you get a chance to. All right, moving on. Thank you, sir. Um, tell us in Union High School presentation, Ms. April Beck. Come on down. She's good smiling. Evening. Can you guys see me over here? Yep, you're great. Yes. Um, well, good evening, Dr. Spurgeon and members of the board. My name's April Beck. I'm the new CTE director in Tolleson, and I'm a new CTE director, period. So I'm very excited to have this opportunity. I am um, not new to Westmec. I've been a friend of Westmec for a long time. I was a uh, Westmec liaison during my counseling days at Dysart. My own son went to um, the avionics. He went through the avionics program. And so I've got to see since at least 2009 the wonderful things that Westmec has brought to students and how you guys have grown. Um, I spent a couple years in Buckeye, and that Southwest campus is just um, blossoming and, and amazing. So um, I appreciate your invitation for me to present about Tolleson. And do I have a clicker or? Sorry. Space bar. Space, Space bar. Oh, got it. Okay. I'm on it. Um, so Tolleson is probably the closest 
high school near you guys. We have Copper Canyon right over here off of um, Camelback. And we are made up of six comprehensive high schools. So I listed the high schools here. And we have a very unique partnership um, with Tolleson Union and University High. So it's kind of a school within a school model. Our University High students are on the campus at Tolleson, and they get to partake in all of the CTE programs that are offered on that campus. And they're also um, our, I believe it was 2021 Blue Ribbon um, School. So we're very proud of our University High students. And we're also, we talk about those honor roll, high honor students taking CTE, uh, that is part of our university high group. We do have our DLA and our CEA, LHA at the bottom. That's our um, alternative programs and our distance learning. So we do have some of those students that I calculated in there because I wanted to show our total enrollment because we are growing. Kids are back. So I, I, we know out of COVID we had a slip. I think everybody did. But our, our um, enrollment's growing. Our programs are growing. And so we're excited to see that. Um, happening. Our kids are back. This year is very different than last year. Our kids are talking to each other and they're participating and engaging in classes. So that was good to see after a year of coming out of a pandemic. So I listed our CTE programs. We have a variety and, and many of them happen on all of our campuses. Uh, the ones that are very specific is our automotive um, tech program at Tolleson High School um, along with our um, engineering Program. So our engineering program is part of the beautiful new school of West Point. I don't know if you've seen it over um, off of Avondale Boulevard, north of McDowell. It's the bright, shiny school in our district. So um, we're very excited that it has an engineering program. And then we also have Westview. That's the only school in our district that has welding. Programs by site. So this shows how many um, programs we have by site, and those are growing, which I have a slide on in a little bit. But um, our long public safety has blossomed throughout our, our, um, our district, and our students drive our choices of what we have to offer. So we truly put out, and this is the time of course selection, with our um, counselors are going out and they're finding out what students are interested in, and then we look at programs for that. Each program has our CTSOs that build leadership as well. Um, I highlighted a couple of programs. So first up, I have Culinary. And Culinary is at Copper Canyon, La Jolla, Sierra Linda, Tolleson, and Westview. We have functioning bistros on the campus, and they cater community events. We just had a great event two weeks ago at uh, La Jolla. They had a murder mystery. So that incorporated our drama students along with our culinary students, and then they also got to serve, and it was a, a very well, um, well participated event. Uh, they also provide um, our appetizers for our advisory council. Our advisory council is coming up next week, and so they'll get to showcase um, their treats. I heard they practiced today, so that's exciting. Um, all the students in culinary have scored above our state benchmark for TSA. Our next program is internship that I'd like to highlight. It's our work-based learning um, program that has really grown in the last couple years. Um, we have great partnerships with Banner Estrella, Main Event, Vern Lewis. And Vern Lewis is not only a, a vendor of ours, they also take in our kids, which is great. And we have students that are helping with podcasts on a sports talk radio, um, and they've really welcomed our students. And what is nice is that our internship has grown to include dual enrollment, and same with culinary. So as we talked, as CJ spoke about dual enrollment in Maryland, those opportunities for our students to get those college credits while in high school, this internship program at some of our high schools, depending on the teachers and their certifications, are able to provide some college credits with their work-based um, we have some shining stars. Uh, we have some. We had a student that placed fourth place in nationals last summer. Um, he has now graduated. Graduated. His name is Sean, and he's attending EMCC. I'm um, studying computer science, so that's a, a a win, and we wanted to share and celebrate that. And then right now we have a state officer 
we have um, Robert Castro. He's at West Point. He's a dragon. And he is um, representing Tullison, which we're very proud of. He's our only state officer. But he also goes around to other schools, and he um, provides uh, information about the CTSOs and advocates for becoming an officer. Uh, TSA data programs, um, the programs that scored above state averages are listed here. And we plan to grow that. That is something that is a goal of ours as a district to, to improve our scores with our TSA. And as I talked about growth, the following um, programs are growing. And I spoke about law and public safety at West Point Tolleson. Uh, they have a great uh, partnership with the Tolleson PD. They're donating one of their police cruisers so they can use it in law and public safety, but that's also part of um, our our automotive tech program that can also utilize that cruiser as well. Um, we have welding at Westview. We have grown for six full sections in welding. So we went from one teacher to two teachers, which is kind of unheard of to get six full sections in a year. So we're very excited that that program is blossoming. Um, we have finance at La Jolla and Westview. And ed professions. Um, we need teachers, as you all know. And we can't speak enough um, about how important it is to instill in our students to give back to their community and have that opportunity to learn about being a teacher while in high school. So we're very excited that um, Ed Professions is coming back. I think it was out there for a while, it laid dormant. Um, it's, it's coming back and we have um, second year programs in all of these schools and La Jolla will have a third year internship next year. So we love to share the importance of CTE with our community. And um, prior to me starting, they had a great relationship uh, with uh, Littleton Elementary School District. Excuse me, not Littleton, Pendergast. So um, Ms. Faison and I went to their superintendent student council. And we presented all about CTE and why you should take CTE classes and the benefits and all the things you guys already know. But it was a great um, afternoon with these students, these eighth grade students, to get them excited. She presented a lesson all about germs and about, she did two activities with them. This one that's in the picture, they got to um, use betadine and a cotton ball and, and see, like, pretend it was blood and then the, the proper way of removing gloves so you don't contaminate. So they got to do that. And then she, they did a little, um, what's better, hand sanitizer versus washing your hands and eighth graders were all over that so it was very very good I um, have feeder district meetings that are coming up next week where I am talking about opportunities for them in high school and advocating CTE programs and the opportunities that they have about certifications and Westmec opportunities during those meetings so we definitely love talking to our community about Westmec so um, as a new leader in my district and CTE I can't tell you how much I appreciate the support of Westmet and the local directors because I know that everybody's a phone call away and I'm on a learning curve this year and I, and I appreciate that. So um, I wanted to share that we appreciate the grants that we get from you, the professional development. We had all of our students go through officer trainings on Saturdays within the last month and they did great and they came out of there inspired. And um, I just wanna thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Any questions? I have a question. Mr. Ramirez. Um, you mentioned that your student programs are driven by student interest. If there's a new program and that hasn't been taught before, how do you accommodate that? Do you go out and hire a new teacher, or does the teacher learn? That's a really good program? question. So we have some schools that are inter interested in some programs. If it's a program that we haven't had in our district before, <coughs> that's a year out. Um, making sure that we have the curriculum, making sure that it's a board approved to have that program. So what some, what some principals will do is throw out some things that can be offered and see what's interested, what students' interest is, and then they go from there about getting things approved. Okay. So for instance, our auto tech um, teacher is really interested in auto collision. So that is something that he discussed with his principal, and they're going to start looking at if the interest is there. Because we don't want to build an interest if the industry doesn't need it yeah. and if students aren't interested in it. 
then it gets expensive if the interest is only there for a year and then nobody right. knows. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair. Dr. Pingarelli. Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Beck, thank you very much for a very succinct presentation. Just a couple of questions. Uh, referring to slide three, and I think you cover this a little bit in a later slide, but what would be your top three or four programs currently? Where do you have uh, your top three or four programs? Um, so that's number, I think it was slide number three. Right here. Uh-huh. And, and just two other questions with regard to that slide. Uh, are you experiencing any capacity issues? And where do you see the trends going in the next couple of years? Those are loaded questions. Thank you. Um, our, our most popular <laughs> programs, I think, are culinary, um, auto, but we need some girls in auto. We need to really bump up our non-trad in auto because what happens, and I spoke with the teacher this year about that, is that they get in, girls get in there and there's only one girl or two girls, and they don't feel comfortable, and then they slide. So we got to find out how to get those non-trad girls um, into automotive. But I would say our top three would be law and public safety, because that's definitely growing, um, our culinary, and our ed professions. I, I'm really proud of our ed profession teachers that that's a growing program. A lot of our programs have been there for a while, and they're very established. But growing ones, um, I would say ed professions. Uh, like I said, culinary, and then the auto. And welding. Well, and thank you, and welding. Um, we lost a welding teacher. so. Okay. And I know that you guys are looking for a welding teacher as well. So that's that's something that I don't know how much we can grow that when we're down a teacher. And I think that's a struggle that a lot of um, districts are facing right now, that it's it's the industry pay versus teacher pay. That's so, what we're going into. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Beck, just one follow-up. So with regard to the culinary program, I noticed you have it across multiple campuses. Uh, what? How many students are actually enrolled? And you say that's trending upwards. So, are you are you are you capable of staffing? Uh, do you have enough resources? What what might you come back and seek some assistance from Westmec for? Well, that is a perfect question because that is something I'm looking at using my rollover funds. Um, we have one. A campus at Tolleson that's uh, their kitchen isn't like any other of the kitchens um, across our district so they have a wall that's separated because when it was originally um, built it didn't it was for a bistro so like the classroom used to be like a staff lounge that could come in and they could feed the staff but it's not an open classroom where they could where that teacher can see everybody so it's a safety concern so we really need to look at that and that's something that um, I will lean on Westmec funds for. Um, I feel like I'm missing another part of your question, though. No, I think you. I think you. Uh, oh, uh, I pretty much addressed it. I, I mean, I, I do it, remember with regard to capacity. Yes. So you asked. So our our um, our schools have two culinary teachers. They teach five sections with 30 to 32 students in them, and they're always full. And um, that is something that um, is hindering Tolleson for having more students in their class because of the way that their kitchen is laid out. So that is something that we definitely need to, to fix because we want to grow we want to grow our programs to help our students. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, you, you kind of touched on it. It's something that we challenge or we're challenged as well. Teacher pay versus industry pay. How do you guys address it? What is... Well, Tolleson... Um, is the highest paid district. Phoenix Union's kind of right there with us, but I, I'm very um, excited over the last three years we've given substantial raises to our teachers. Um, so that I think has helped hold on to our teachers to keep them there. I think teaching right now is a, a very difficult profession to be in. Um, we not only lost a welding teacher, but we did lose a law and public safety teacher just um, for various reasons. So we, we attract um, teachers, I think, due to our pay and due to our superintendent, um, I think, her voice and her advocacy for teachers. 
Okay, but you still haven't answered the, is teacher pay equal to industry pay? Oh, no. Then, then how do you address that? Because how do you get them, how do you attract them out of industry to come for a pay cut, and how do you keep them there? So that is the greenness of me being in my first year. I don't have the answer to that. Okay. But I definitely need to know the answer to that. Because that's, that's our challenge, too, Correct. and I think that's what we're all trying to struggle with because we're not, we're not the private industry. Well, I think another challenge, too, is just because you're an industry doesn't mean you want to teach or that you would you have those skills to become a teacher. Sure. So just, just as a, a final follow-up on uh, um, Mr. Strucka's uh, question, so um, because I've researched this, too, so just as a baseline, if I look at Peoria Unified, the average teacher pay, just of a regular teacher, a non-CTE teacher, was recently increased to about 48000 per annum. Uh, for a teacher in Mesa, um, and that school district is 59,000 59, students, 80 some schools, their average pay was recently increased to uh, 54,000 per annum. So again, just a non-teacher. And I do realize that different, teach not all teachers are the same. A welding teacher, an aviation teacher, a culinary teacher are going to be, are going to prescribe different types of, of, of salaries. So let me ask the question then with all that, what is the average starting, if you know, the average starting pay of a teacher at Tolleson, and notwithstanding your question about uh, welding, what do you see as the greatest challenge for other CTE programs um, at Tolleson? Well, I do not know the starting pay of, of teachers, but I do know um, that we have grown, I want to say, up to 18% in raises in the last three years. And, and that has made us very um, competitive when it comes to teachers. Like we are pulling teachers from neighboring school districts because of the pay. Um, there's something else I wanted to share with y'all. Um, how we hold on to teachers, I think, is, and how we attract them, I think it's really hard. In our district, our pay for CTE teachers is the same as any teacher. So you sign a teacher contract and it's the same pay. So depending on what that CTE teacher does, sometimes there'll be stipends and they can earn more money, but their contract says they're a teacher and just like all the other teachers, CTE is not different in our district. I'm just curious, <clears throat> the finance course, what are some of the elements that are taught and what kind of opportunities for employment are there for those students? Well, our finance, one of our finance programs is at La Jolla, and Ms. Kuhn is, um, she's a financial consultant, so they have a great teacher in that program. They go over, um, I can't remember the, the program that she uses. I, I know one of them is Knowledge Matters, but she is talking to them um, about debt. She's talking to them about um, Savings. I, I wish I had more to tell you, but so is it more life skills? Um, I think part of it's life skills. Part of it is um, being smart and, like you said, life skills with your mortgage and your banking account and those types of things. But she also goes into the different careers that they can have with finance. Those students also run the school store at La Jolla. Open every day after school. Anything else? Well, thank you. You did great for the first time, especially. So and, and the questions are if this, we're struggling with the same things, and that's why we ask the questions. It's like, hey, does anyone have an answer? So thank I know, you very I, much. I, I wouldn't be here if I had the answer. Right? I'd be touring somewhere. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, Mr. Guy, the CTSO Officer Support or Report with the rest of the team. Uh, good evening, Chairman Straker, members of the board, 
Dr. Spurgeon, thank you for the opportunity. This is always an exciting celebration we get to do every year about the CTSO awards and accomplishments of our programs and, and all the good things happening every day with students and um, through CTSO. So I'm excited to present that. Fortunately, I'm going to go quickly and just kind of give you a district perspective and kind of some supports. And then I've got some folks that are much, uh, much more exciting than me to share from a campus and teacher perspective um, the good work that's happening. So, um, um, so as we carry out this mission, of course, this noble mission of preparing our students for tomorrow's careers, we know that we use this, this vehicle of this delivery model to help us achieve that goal. And so all of those aspects of that delivery model are very important to us. Um, but tonight we're going to really talk about that leadership development component and how through leadership development it really allows us to, to really enhance that learning opportunity for students and to... You know, CTSOs are a vehicle to help us develop those leadership skills in students, but also those professional skills um, of communication and all those other aspects that our industry partners tell us continually are, are the most important things for them, um, even beyond some of the technical skills and that we teach them in the program as well. The credentials, of course, are extremely valuable to them, but without that being coupled with these leadership and professional skills, um, our students really, really are at a disadvantage. So that, that really sets us aside and gives our students that competitive advantage. So those professional skills that we, our students are able to learn through the, the great advisors that they have in their CTSOs and those, those experiences, they're able to learn these professional skills and give them that competitive edge out there. So <clears throat> some, just some great celebrations you guys have in your, in your packet. The, that, that big document that really celebrates all of the state, the regional, state, and national winners, both at our central programs as well as our satellite programs. Um, just, a, just lots of success out there. Um, we capture as much data as we can get from across the state from our member districts um, in those different CTSOs. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, I wanted to highlight something that we think is pretty cool. In addition to those state and national awards, We've highlighted some of the state officers. Over the last couple of years, um, we continue to have students that are um, officers in our chapters that then apply and become officers at the state level and even the national level. So you can see there, uh, last year and into this year, we've just had a variety of students that have, have not only leading with us at the local level, they're leading at the state level and moving on even to the national level. So um, really cool to see that they're taking the, that learning and, and having that confidence to, to take those skills to the next level. <clears throat> because we prioritize this learning for our students, we know how much of an impact it makes for them, we really have tried to invest in making sure that our teachers have support in, in these areas, so that our teachers who are the, our advisors have the, the skills um, and the understanding and the nuts and bolts of how to run CTSOs and try to provide support for them. And so something that we did that I wanted to highlight um, this year um, is we, through the collaboration with our PD department and CNI and under leadership of Dr. Laura Jaime and, and Joel Wakefield, we created uh, one of our um, PD specialists, Patrick Clausen, who couldn't be here with us tonight because he's actually teaching a PD course on the other side of town um, for us through the premiere series. But he, um, his role, we've really um, championed his role to be really a PD specialist for all of our teachers. So all of our CNI specialists provide support for teachers and CTSOs, but we really wanted to tailor kind of a go-to um, in, in our PD and CNI team to be able to provide that support for teachers. So you can see some areas there um, that he's kind of built goals around what that support looks like in those main areas of officer training all the way to, you know, attendance at regional competitions, those major kind of cornerstones of CTSOs is really where he's tailored his work around to provide that support for teachers. And we've seen some great success with that this year. Um, uh, Tolleson mentioned earlier, the officer training um, for our central programs. Um, we were able to provide, we've always provided PD support for our, our CTSO officer training. Um, Patrick Clausen and the, and the team at PD were able to provide kind of some consistent curriculum and some common objectives and then be kind of a, a single point of contact for those materials. But then really that, that training for our students was owned at the campus level with our with our advisors really leading that um, along with their campus administration and so but having that 
that single origin that can help with materials and resources and provide support as needed um, really helps with that officer training. Um, Patrick, in his role, is able to, he sets up, um, you know, meetings, one-on-one -on -one coaching with our teachers, especially our newer teachers that need more support. Um, and, and we have in Domain 6, as you guys know, our, our evaluation really outlines um, CTSO expectations, so he really supports them to be successful in that area. And then we have a common area through our Canvas system to house all the, the documents and materials. And then we also provide, Patrick and the PD team provide support throughout our member districts in officer training as well. So just wanted to highlight that support we're providing um, and those kind of systems in place to help support um, support our teachers to be successful in these efforts. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mike Johnson, our Northwest Campus Assistant Campus Administrator, to talk about what things look like at a campus level. Thank you, Mr. Guy and Chairman Stradakin, Governing Board members, Dr. Spurgeon. I'm excited to share a little bit about the roles of Assistant Campus Administrators and CTSOs and, and some of the great new things we're doing, but also some of the celebrations that we have. Uh, so, as Ms. Beck mentioned, and all the different uh, CTSO officer training that's done, I know large part by our professional development uh, uh, department here in West Mech, we have started to work with them to collaborate with the leadership of Pat Clausen uh, to be able to take that to our campuses. Uh, so we as assistant campus administrators are starting to facilitate those, um, have some norms, and then be able to build some teacher leadership uh, to be able to present those trainings uh, with that. This year we provided over 400 students with officer training. Uh, on our campuses um, in partnership with PD versus PD having to go out and do that. As their schedule gets bigger and our member districts get bigger, um, that need for those officer trainings is growing. Um, another big big part that uh, the assistant campus administrators do is oversee the activities and fundraisers, fundraisers each year. I know on our campus we have hundreds and hundreds. Last year we had about 420 activities through the year that we help track, calendar, and organize, make sure the right paperwork's going in. Uh, but also help oversee those events. And I know there's some great events going on. Uh, Central Campus did uh, their trunk or treat uh, a couple weeks ago. They had 550 community and industry members there, along with all their students and help. Um, on November 19th, Southwest Campus is doing their signature event. They have their welding thunder, they have a craft fair, their programs are doing a bunch of different things. On November 19th, the Northeast Campus, as many of you know, have done their touch of truck and some different things where they're engaging that community, uh, working through that. Um, and Northwest Campus has had some car shows with power sports and having some ATVs. Uh, Mrs. Ray, who will talk to you here shortly, has a winter wonderland and a community service project that they're doing. So a lot of great work uh, going on uh, through that. Another big part for assistant campus administrators is organizing some of the travel. And this is where we're really blessed to have partnership with the business office. And thank you to them uh, and their work that they've done, but really to streamline that. Uh, last year for nationals, we had uh, about 150 students go uh, fly across the country to go compete in multiple different events, whether it was in FBLA skills or in HOSA. Uh, in the state level, we were, uh, I believe, the three to 400, somewhere in that range, of students who were going off to compete at those state levels. Um, with that. So a lot of great things and partnerships and building some systems to really be able to maximize that and make sure our students have those opportunities. And the last part, something that's going on now we wanted to share with you, we help oversee the testing um, of scheduling and testing for different CTSOs. Currently, as we talk about all the different events, HOSA has actually started their regional online testing. So I know a lot of times we hear about uh, the national testing during the summer and the state testing that happens in late March or April, uh, but these students are participating in those events year round. Um, uh, between this week and next week, uh, we have uh, hundreds of students across our campuses uh, doing online regional testing uh, to help qualify them for the regional uh, uh, program events. Um, last year on our campus, we had over 1,200 tests taken uh, for those. So those are a few things and some of the great work that my colleagues, the assistant campus administrators are doing across the district. I want to share those with you. Uh, but more importantly, I'm going to pass it on to Stacy Ray. And when we talk about CTSOs, a lot of times we talk about the uh, events and you know all the different competitions we go to, but they're, one of the great things that we see happening constantly across our district is the great work that our teachers do as the advisors working with their students on community service. So Mrs. Ray is going to talk to you a little bit about that and her role and the amazing job that she does. And I would just like to lead in that a lot of the things you hear uh, Stacy talk about here are done by teachers across our district. We have great things going on on every campus. Uh, and great work through that. So from there, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Ray. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. 
Um, I was asked to talk about HOSA and community service, so two of my favorite things. So I was like, sure. Um, as part of HOSA, community service is, is huge. So our students have the opportunity to receive different types of awards for different things they do. And some of these awards require a certain amount of volunteer hours and some other things like essays, personality tests, and presentations. But last year, um, 85 of our 90 students had more than 50 volunteer hours, which is great. Uh, we were able to have two platinum, two gold, several silver, and then everyone else received the bronze award for their individual award. Uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, Mrs. Mendoza and I, we set a goal of 50 hours uh, with hopes of getting gold chapter. We haven't gotten that yet, but we're working on it. Um, this means that every student has to have all of the awards prior to gold chapter to receive that. So far, we've gotten bronze chapter, but we're hoping for silver this year. Um, we make several different types of community service available to our students. Uh, some of these things are on campus uh, for kids that have transportation issues, and a lot of them are off campus. I don't know if you've seen our kindness rock garden at our campus, but students have an opportunity to make kindness rocks. They paint rocks and they put positive sayings on them, and then we can pick them up and deliver them to different places like retirement homes, parks, trails. Um, definitely not state parks. We learned that the hard way. Those were returned to us. Uh, we do things like Ronald McDonald House, where we make dinner for the guests that are staying there. This is always interesting, having high school kids make dinner. Um, do I peel the onion before I cut it, miss? So culinary would have been great for some of these people. Uh, we also work with an organization called Homeless Youth Connection, where we make turkey baskets, and they're basically baskets that are filled with everything that's needed for a Thanksgiving dinner for families that are less fortunate. This year, Northwest Campus is making 77 baskets, um, 31 of which are coming from medical assisting, which is great. We volunteer at St. Mary's Food Bank, which is where we pack food boxes for families in need. Uh, for St. Mary's, we also participate in what's called Super Saturday. So the Saturday before Thanksgiving, a group of kids will stand outside a grocery store and we ask for donations of like turkeys, uh, non-perishable food, and monetary donations. I even have a turkey costume that one of my students will wear, and if I can't get a student to wear it, I'm pretty sure it will fit Mr. Johnson. Um, something else that we do at our campus that we've done every year since I've been there is called Teens for Jeans. So after Christmas, we do a, a little thing called Teens for Jeans where we collect used denim, any size, any condition, and that denim is donated to a shelter. Um, that I find, and this is how I got involved with the two nonprofit groups that are on that slide right there. Um, I met the founder of Hearts for the Homeless when I was looking for somewhere to donate the jeans last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. I took a whole truckload of jeans to her home and dropped them off, and that's when she invited me to go with her to downtown where the tents are to distribute those jeans to the homeless. And <clears throat> excuse me. at the time, I was kind of scared to do that, and I said no. Um, but I went home and I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I need to do it at least once. So I called her, and my husband and I ended up going with her downtown to where the tents are and distribute all these jeans and other items. And long story short, now I volunteer for Hearts for the Homeless every Sunday. And we feed, um, we feed the homeless about 200 every Sunday. Uh, we pass out hygiene packs. Um, last week, my students made 200 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for us to pass out. And through Hearts for the Homeless, I met Michelle, who runs Backpacks for Kids Arizona. <coughs> they are a nonprofit started by an 11-year-old girl and her mother. Um, they provide thousands of disadvantaged kids with backpacks, school supplies, hygiene, clothing, toys, and more. So my students have had several volunteer opportunities with them. And now, as Mr. Johnson said, um, the Northwest Campus is actually hosting their Christmas event that we're calling Winter Wonderland. It's going to be at our campus on December 17th, and families who qualify can come and pick out toys for their children um, while our students entertain the kids with things like haircuts, um, arts and crafts, and more. So we're hoping this is going to be a huge success, and we'd really like to have it be ongoing. And then uh, in closure, um, I forgot to tell Mike and Holly this today, but we were contacted by a news station. I think it was Channel 12 this morning. Um, they do a segment called Do Something Good. And I don't know, uh, Mrs. Wiley, is because you share every Facebook post I post, but um, they, it sounds like they're going to highlight us um, on their Do Something Good segment. So thank you very much. That's it.
Hey, real quick, could you just, um, how, what's the qualification for bronze, silver, and gold? I know you're trying to get there, but I... That's okay. Uh, for bronze, they have to have a minimum of 10 volunteer hours, and then it just goes up from there to 20, to 30, to 50. <clears throat> and then with each level, there's more things attached to it, like essays and presentations. Every student in the group? Every student in medical assisting is bronze. And then I did have some go higher. Thank you for <clears throat> bringing these to our attention. We know about the community service. Sometimes it gets highlighted by repairing airplanes or cars. When I'm talking with family and friends and neighbors about CTE, one of the things I tell them, we teach them how to be community members. The very things you highlighted, I am so proud that we teach young people that. I'm so proud when you were talking about the airline reservations, which you do, some of these kids probably, that might be their only flight. What's the TSA? What can I take? What can I do? It goes far beyond pounding the dents out of cars, replacing the piston in the airplane. Thank you for what all of you do, and thank all the kids. Uh, I saw Mr. Cook here earlier. Do we take advantage of letting the community know and people know what our kids are doing? Social media. I, think, I think social media is a big, a big part of that. We, we try to post at least twice a week um, the good things that we're doing, the things we're doing out in the community, try to get West Mex name out there, and just try to teach our kids to be good people. What a positive way to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, each one of our chapters on our campuses have a social, have a social media page, whether Instagram, Facebook, but Instagram and, and well, I have Facebook. you have Facebook because <laughs> that's what the parents read. That's oh, what that's what Mrs. Wiley shares. Yeah. Yeah. I don't do the Instagram. Come on, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. so, so they all have pages where they are able to share those things, and then and then Mr. Cook and his team can then share those on our district social media as well um, to really spread that word out. So. Unfortunately, I'm not a social media fan. <laughs> That's my problem, and I understand that. Okay. And, I, and I just want to share, too, that as we look at that list, many of those, uh, for, I'll highlight the Homeless Youth Connection, they are a partner with us here at Westmex. So we have students that are utilized and receive services from the Homeless Youth Connection. So not only um, are they just something that we believe in, but also they are there to serve, and they are a partner to us, and they help students each year within, within our district. Do you, you reach every student with this? I do my best. Uh, when I made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches the other day, I had uh, 50 students. So I said, four at a time, make four sandwiches, pull a stick, send another one. Four sandwiches, pull a stick, send another one. So I had four peanut butters, four jellies, two packers, and it was like a, like a factory. Because every student wanted to be a part of it, so that was the only way I could think to do it. That's great. And I would add to that, that is, is you uh, think about what a CTSO is, this is a component of that, is that service learning is really? part of our curriculum. Um, and something what? That, something that they all do. Do the math. Yes, sir. Do we have totals? Like, do we have Westmec, uh, this many community service hours by all of our students district-wide? Do we have that? Yes, probably not as detailed as we as we could capture it, but we do have a snap. We did not include it in tonight's um, presentation. No, that's fine. You have it ready for the TV. <laughs> yeah, well, but so we do track. But really, like, like I know, what part of the part of Perkins saying and the thing we record in FFA is, you know, our <laughs> dollars earned or dollars contributed through our work-based learning programs and all of that kind of stuff, and yeah. and and to see it in one program is great, but like. What's that, what's that total on that campus? And then more importantly, what's that total across the district? And well, I'm not sure how Skills does it, but uh, Hosa, we have to track everything via the computer. Right. So in order for these kids to get these awards, all of their hours have to be logged. So I'm sure Skills probably has the same. Well, I would, I, would, uh, I would encourage you to try, and this will be harder. What, what is Westmec and all of our satellite programs contributing? Right, and if that number could be found, because I think that, that that's the kind of number that that impacts legislature. legislature and voters, and you know if whatever that number is, I'm sure it's north of a hundred thousand hours, but like whatever that, this is how many hours 
students in West Mech, Central and Satellite students have contributed to the West Valley, you know, in this year. Those are the kinds of numbers that really, really, really make an impact. Yeah, we have, um, thank you, it, it, the um, Go Tracker that we've shared with you guys before, so we have a new tool that I think is going to help us get a lot closer there. And so that, so through that tool that we're piloting this year, one of the things that we can track um, through there is service learning hours. So in addition to work-based learning activities and credentials, service learning is a piece that we can track in there. So we're, we're, we're certainly learning a lot from that tool this year, and I think that's going to give us some good data at the end of the year, and then we'll be able to tweak that and make it even better for next year. But I think we have the, the vehicle to better capture this uh, for our central programs, and I think eventually that could grow um, to satellite programs as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. For having information on our Winter Wonderland. I'll leave in the back if anybody wants to grab that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item number 13. Um, with Mr. Kaltenbach's retirement of the board, from the board, uh, there is a award on a roll at ASBA that I think is well deserving of him and recognizing his 18 years of service to West Mech. Uh, I personally, Jim, I look to you represent all the teachers. You have a teacher's insight. You have a CTSO insight CT, that I've relied on and I'm so grateful for the years that I've got to work with you. Um, on the board, so but I'm still going to be calling you. That's fine. But um, I would love to make that motion, and I'll open it up if we just anything you'd like to say. Make the motion. I'll second it. We nominate Mr. Kelbach. But if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say a few words. When I came on the board, you don't know a lot, do you? <laughs> but you know, Mr. Kaltenbach is just a wealth information. He has donated his time, his talent, and his knowledge for he, how many years, Jim? It'll be 18 when I'm done. 18 years. And I'm not trying to sing the harp of the school board, but the pay's enormous. <laughs> the hours are enormous. And a lot of times, you can't win no matter what you decide. But Mr. Kaltenbach, for 18 years, has been here to go through the board agenda, to look through it, and provide all that background over the years. Actually, just about since our inception. Pretty close? Mm -hmm. And it's invaluable. We, in my estimation, will be losing an enormous talent. And personally, I would like to thank him for all of his years of service. We'll do that more. But I would also like to second the motion that we nominate him for this award. Thank you. I just have a few words. I've uh, been here now. I think this is my one year anniversary. Good job. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I want to say it. I want to thank you especially because uh, uh, I've learned a lot from your questions. From your questions, uh, very insightful than the answers you elicit from the presenters, and then just uh, the insight you've given me after the meetings. I really appreciate you taking the time and explaining a lot of stuff to me. So I'm really thankful for that. Appreciate it, and, and for your service to Westmic, of course. And I'll still be calling you. <laughs> so I'll answer. Dr. Pingarelli, anything? Yeah, just. You know, I have known Jim for a while, and uh, I know he's a wealth of knowledge, and uh, um, I think also uh, as we move forward, um, you know, never know, uh, Representative Pingarelli uh, will likely uh, call on Mr. Kallenbach to ask his advice. All right. All right, just, uh, I made the motion. Mr. Miglarino seconded the motion. Any more discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? You're not voting for yourself? I think I'll abstain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mr. Popbach abstains, but thank you. 
Um, thank you. Thank you just does not seem sufficient. But very good. Coach. Goes with the pay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Moving on to item number 14. Mr. Guy, Dr. Spurgeon, would you like to introduce this one? Absolutely. Come on up, Jared. So just so each person on the board knows what this item is, uh, I know in times past um, the items were brought to the board maybe without a lot of discussion about those items before bringing them here, and so I thought I might do a, take a different route. So the items that are bringing here tonight, I'm just asking for your permission to move forward to explore and or to go out and bring the information back for the board to consider so that you're aware of what we're actually thinking about doing. All the things you're gonna hear about tonight, other than the Northeast Campus, which was brought to the board, I believe about a year or so ago last year. The rest of these are a combination of the meetings, the conversations, the business and industry, uh, all the things that I've picked up over the last four months since I've been here, plus the team's collective wisdom around what should we be doing right now to get prepared for what comes next for, next for West Mac. And so what you're gonna hear this evening is kind of our vision about what we should be doing coming moving forward, but I just want the item to just ask for, are you okay with us moving forward to spend the effort to go out and bring the information back for you to consider uh, specific projects for us at Westpac? If you don't like this process, I can go back the way it was before and just bring them to you. You can prove them, move forward. If not, I just thought this might be a good way to make sure that you're fully aware, or at least mostly aware of what are we thinking, what's coming, what am I looking forward to, and at least to give you the opportunity to see what that is. So with that, Mr. Guy. Thank you, Dr. Spurgeon. And I apologize, Chairman Straker, members of the board, you have to hear from me again, but I um, appreciate the introduction uh, to Dr. Spurgeon. We're, um, as, as Dr. Spurgeon referenced, we are going to talk about some specifics about Northeast Campus and some of the, the, the growth at Northeast Campus to meet those, those industry demands that we believe um, we've heard loud and clear from industry. Um, and then we'll talk about some, some bigger picture projects as well across the district. So. Um, as we jump into this, you know, really our central campuses play a key role in us for, for us to achieve that mission of preparing our students with, you know, the, the facilities and the spaces that meet those industry demands um, are critical for us to be able to achieve that mission. And so we're continually looking um, to research what, what are the, the right programs to be offering our students, what are the right skills and using business and industry to help drive that for us. And so, um, so that's what we've been doing and a lot of this research over the last, last several months um, and, and with the growth that we have in our economy right now and the industries that are growing, um, really that demand is, is higher than ever. And so some examples of, of some of the, the research that we've done um, to kind of get us to um, some of the, the ideas that we're bringing for you today. Um, you know, through our industry, um, obviously through industry surveys, um, through some of our, we partner a lot with Westmark and, and some of the surveys that Westmark does as well, so we can piggyback and glean a lot of information from those. We do our own parent surveys to, to see what our parents and community are feeling, as well as our students, of course, and then, and then we use economic modeling software in addition to that to really kind of bring all that together based on what our stakeholders are asking for, what is, what is the economic modeling telling us that are gonna be the biggest demand industries and where the growth is happening at, and then of course listening one-on-one -on -one to, to our industry partners. And having those, so, so a lot of, there's kind of, the, kind of a lot of research we do, and then we couple that with these partnership meetings. So we've had, I, I couldn't even count how many <laughs> we've had over the last few months um, uh, with different industry partners, not just industry partners, with our member districts, look, meeting with our member districts, what are their needs, what are their demands. Um, our, our commission, our industry commission that we have, and it, it's kind of our higher level advisory council. Um, the Office of Economic Opportunity, the Arizona Commerce Authority, um, and we've met with, I mean, uh, some of the partners that um, uh, C.J. Williams referenced earlier from TSMC, from Nestle, from, I mean, just a lot of partners we're dealing with, and we're asking them those key questions. What, what are the skills that you need? How can we best prepare our students? Um, and, and how do we meet, and what is that demand out there, and how do we meet that need? And so, <clears throat> a lot of that research is coming together in some of these, these do recommendations. Do they all come to you, or do you have to reach out to all them? Or is it both? I think it's both. I think it's both. I, I know under Dr. Spurgeon's leadership, we've initiated a lot of those communications to, to open the door for those conversations. But but others, they, they have such a need right now that they, yeah. um, 
they're looking for where is that pipeline going to come from. And so some of them are reaching out to us, but others it's like, hey, you know, we, we are who you need to be talking to and, and having those individual meetings with them, touring them on our campuses so they can see what we do. Um, has been happening a lot lately, which which changes the conversation because they see yeah. there's a, they see a lot of correlations to what we already do, um, and then sometimes it's hey we need more of this. How do we tweak what we're already doing or create new programming potentially to meet that need? Ms. why I'm going to say it's probably a 70 30. If I had to guess, 70 30 percent, probably 70 of, of us making the initiative and 30 percent of those coming to us. And keep in mind, because of COVID, there's a lot of new people in new positions that have left their company or new companies have started and things like that. But I think just having the relationships with the chambers of commerce and the economic development teams, uh, a lot of that word spreads around. With, hey, you really need to talk to Dr. Spurk, you need to talk to Westmec so that word continues to spread. So it's starting to shift from 70 to 30, where now there's more individuals coming to us. And we're looking at a point where, you know, people should be saying, God, how, how could you be, how'd you be, get to be a part of Westmec? We can't, we can't get in. That's the kind of partners that we're looking for, where there's a balance of 50% on our side and 50% on their side, where we're really doing great things for kids. But I'd say now it's probably 70 30, our initiative. So honing in a little specifically on, on Northeast campus, so this that's a real picture. There is actually a parking lot. The parking lot, lot is done. Campus. That was campus. <laughs> what is that? Eight, eight, eight years? How, how long has it been? Eight? No, it's been longer than that. I mean, not eight. It's probably four. been huh? at, least, at least four. Oh, four. it feels longer than that. <laughs> so I can tell you it was the last time I was board chairman, not this time, but the previous time, because Greg said, oh, let's put it on my goals. We can get it done in a year. So whenever I was board chairman, not these three years, but the previous three. That, well, do you remember the meeting we had out at Northeast and is it Mr. Zavornik or went through all this and that? And one of the things I got to tell you is I was going through the board packet. I was talking about Jim. When you put a slide or like that in there, I can see right away how many parking places we have, how many we put in, what we're going to have, how many go to the staff. I like it. Do that with everything else that we're going to be talking about. And I would love it. We have doubled student parking with that expansion. Yeah, I, you know, I remember that meeting. Actually, is this presentation a result of that meeting? We were going to hear from staff about Northeast. Was that a year ago, two years ago? It's been a year, one year ago? Yeah. And we got to it. <laughs> and Thanks. so this, this has been, so this parking has been, right, this has been a hurdle oh, for a long time, a too. We couldn't really expand without, we were so limited on parking. Right. The, the airport authority. Hall. Yeah, so that hurdle, we've, awesome. we've gotten over it. So it's awesome. Is this the Dr. See. Spencer Isom Memorial? Like, he's not dead. <laughs> 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 Rename it. Like, what a black Spencer Isom. Like, parking <laughs> parking yeah. lot to Dr. Isom. He's not parking. He's not, it's not <laughs> Memorial, but like, yeah, in honor of, I don't know. Like, Honorary parking lot. We can have a spot for him. <laughs> Anytime. Can you imagine? <laughs> So, Mr. Miglarino, one of the things that I have to be honest and say is, is with all of the the work that's going to be available for the TSMC plant, there's, I'm the reason why we brought this back because we can't set this one out. There's there's so much, there's so many opportunities for for our students that are going to be in, uh, available on that that site. Uh, in the real near future and beyond. There's just, we have to do something at the Northeast campus to get this ball rolling. Well, I remember walking out with a certain individual who used to be with us and talking about thinking outside the box. I don't think you were with us. You know, do we buy the property across the street? Buy out the uh, cargo places, you know, if we need lead. Do we go up uh, vertically? I, I don't have all the answers, but we were talking about thinking outside the box because that's a very valuable campus with very valuable programs and very full, but it's in a great spot. A great spot. And I have to commend the board for having the insight to buy that property. That was just before I became a board member. And I think Mr. Straka, you were here. It, it came to us steal. because it came to us because the um, the family now Jake Long. the Long family found it. And we didn't have the money, so they said they'd buy it, wow. and we, we it. could buy it from them for what they paid for it or what is it worth, whichever was less. Well, if it I'm went sure. down in value, they would eat the loss. If it went up in value, they wouldn't take any profit. 
That's wonderful. I'm sure by now Dr. Spurgeon has heard how generous the Long yes. family has been to West Mac and instrumental in getting us going. But what a buy. And it's utilized pretty darn well now. But we've been, I think Mr. Straka, you and I have both been waiting to see what they want to do there. Yeah. Right? And so now that we have, you know, we have the parking capacity to meet the, meet the demands, um, which is a big hurdle. So now, as, as Dr. Spurgeon referenced, we've really taken all this research and all the feedback from industry and narrowed that down to at Northeast Campus with the space that we have, what, what is the best, um, the best use of space to finish out that campus um, and add these opportunities for, for students. And so these two, um, these two spaces you hear, um, you hear, you see on the slide here, automated industrial technology, um, as well as electric and hybrid vehicles technologies are the two areas that um, we feel like we can best serve those needs on this campus um, with some growth there. And so the, just so you can kind of get a frame of reference on that map there, that the automated industrial technology, that first of all, that program is really around serving the needs of TSMC and those advanced manufacturing um, and semiconductor manufacturing skills. And so automated industrial technology, that, that's a de, the, the name, that's a degree pathway that is a collaborative effort under the governor's um, guidance um, about, about about six or seven years ago at the community college district they created to meet the advanced manufacturing needs they created this automated industrial technology pathway and, and it's an associate's degree offered at several colleges throughout the state so our programming um, in collaboration also with the community college TSMC and those those foundational skills within that degree pathway meet a lot of the demands that they have. And so we want to make sure that as we prepare our students, we're not, you know, we're, we're doing something that's going to create those pathways we talked about earlier into post-secondary education and right into the workforce. And so that's that, just, that name, automated industrial technology. Just know that's advanced manufacturing skills that we're looking to fill that need, semiconductor manufacturing. And then electric and hybrid vehicles, another huge growth area. Um, our advisory council members and, and, and all of our economic data tell us we, we need to do more in this area. We need to better prepare students in that area. And so those are kind of the, the ideas that we'd like to move forward with researching on, uh, on, our, on our Northeast campus. Just so you can see here, I know there's a lot of, a lot of it, it's hard to read all of this on here, but just to give you a snapshot of, as I talk about those industry partners, give you a snapshot as we talk about automated industrial technology, here's just a snapshot of some of the folks that we've been talking to about this, from TSMC to Nestle, Core Power, Funko, Ball Corporation, um, just, I mean, just a sampling of, of the groups that we've been talking to about how do we fill this need that you have, what are the common skill sets, what are the specific things someone like a big player like a TSMC needs um, that we can meet those demands. And same thing on the electric and hybrid electric vehicles. Um, through our advisory council, you can see the folks that we're currently working with. We're continuing to expand those partnerships to get more and more feedback um, in these areas. But just, just so you know, some of, the, some of the players, if you will, that we've been working with to get input um, on what we can best do to serve those needs. <clears throat> so just a, a, a snapshot of what we're talking about um, exploring. Um, further is is to have an automated industrial technology um, space in the, the existing hangar building. So the existing hangar building, as you guys know, is just kind of, um, it was a shell when we bought the building, the hangar was there. Um, but taking that building and be able to turn that into a two-story building um, to be able to add on the second floor, um, at least on the second floor, space for, for AIT programming, lab space, classrooms, um, and really fit that to the specific industry equipment that we would need to, to meet the needs of that program. Potentially, the bottom floor could serve as a multi-purpose community space, similar that we have on other campuses. Again, these are just different ideas we're exploring. Nothing is, is set in stone on these plans. Um, and <clears throat> the second part of that would be to build a new electric vehicle building. You saw on that map before, kind of we have a piece of real estate, uh, uh, the only piece of dirt really left on Northeast campus to build a new electric hybrid vehicle space uh, to accommodate, again, those labs, classrooms, um, to be able to serve that need. 
These are very specific, both, both of these programs, like many of our programs, require very specific uh, equipment, power requirements, um, design of the space um, to in order to meet those demands that our industry partners are asking for. <clears throat> this is a snapshot, just again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but some of the equipment, as we talk about really building those specific spaces, you've got to, in order to build industry-driven programs, we've got to have that, that equipment that meets those. And so just a sampling of some of the equipment that will be needed um, as we explore so far in our research, um, the types of trainers and equipment that our students are going to need access to in order to, to learn these skills um, as a part of this. It's not as much, the buildings are important, of course, but what happens inside those buildings is, is critically important. So that's kind of northeast campus and, and what our thoughts and goals are to finish out that campus based on our research and, and ideas moving forward. In addition to Northeast campus, um, we've been doing a lot of work, um, again, with these partnership meetings. It hasn't been specific conversations just to Northeast campus. How, how can we better align what we're doing on our other campuses and look to do that better in the future? And so some other big picture ideas that, that we're looking at. Um, Dr. Yeah, let me jump in real quick. So yeah. one of the things we're looking at is, is uh, proximity, because proximity matters. And so we're looking at the programs and services we offer at each of our campuses and what actual business and industry will be in that geographic footprint so that we can <laughs> ensure that the students that are actually in those programs are going to be really close, because many students don't want to be too far from home, plus transportation is still, still, still an issue, which that helps eliminate that. The proximity helps eliminate some of that. And so when you look up here, uh, the, the next one is the southeast uh, Southwest Campus. We we met with Nestle, and Nestle looked at uh, all of our energy and in, in engineering labs, and they told us we've been in a two-year, four-year technical schools. We've never seen anything like this. In fact, there's not very many things left that they would actually need to ensure the training of, uh, of our students to ensure to come, come right out into their, their factories. And what's really interesting, and I think I may have mentioned this, is they're looking at hiring our students at age 16, 17, and 18 through their work-study program to get them into certain parts of the manufacturing environment in which they can exist at 16, 17, and 18 years old. So the Southwest Campus includes adding that automated industrial technology component to ensure that that advanced manufacturing piece is also a part of what Southwest uh, Campus offers. And, and Mr. Strake, I think we've talked about this, blue collar, white collar, this is more of a new collar opportunity. And really it expands a West Mac into opportunities where maybe some students and parents may have not considered West Mac. It, it, it might be something that may open up a new opportunity for some parents to say, wait a second, maybe that's not my child getting his hands dirty you know, for the rest of his life, it's going to be more of a new collar job, which you get into TSMC and Nestle, you're talking about some pretty good money moving forward. IT security, we're looking at a couple of campuses, maybe all three of them. If I've heard it once, I've heard it probably 50 or 60 times. IT security, cybersecurity, and coding is all over the place. In fact, our students are so sought after. I mean, it's almost like our electricians program they're gone. I mean, they're just, somebody picks them up every single time, and oftentimes they pick them up before they even get out of our programs. So I've got a couple of our individuals uh, going to um, uh, Maryville University, which we had a partnership when I was in St. Louis. They were the first university, I believe, in America to offer the first four-year cybersecurity, uh, four-year program degree. And they just had a build out of their 2.0 IT security lab. So we're sending them to go check that out because I'd like to be able to expand our labs to include all the cybersecurity things that are the latest and greatest updates to be able to ensure that our students, because every time we add a new piece of equipment, a new piece of curriculum, it could potentially add a new certification, a new opportunity for our students to get out. And again, we want, to, we want to get our students the opportunity to be at the top of the stack, and that's what we're after, get them to the top of the stack. If you look at uh, uh, the Northwest Campus Adult Education Opportunities, right now we're working to certify uh, the Northwest Campus to be able to offer adult education programs. Right now they can't until they get their certification. Once they do that, we're going to add some adult education programs. Now, and I, I didn't know this until I, until I was told maybe a couple of weeks ago, if you start a brand new adult education program on a, on a certificated campus, it has to be there 24 months before the, they can actually apply for federal funding or, or grants and things like that to be able to go to school. If you offer a program that's already been in the district for at least 24 months, then, the, then those grants and things can apply. And so we're working with Surprise Economic Development Opportunities. That's why we met with Ottawa as well. What can we do in partnership-wise to build an adult education program at the Northwest Campus? We're not sure what that's gonna look like, but we know IT security is definitely gonna be a part of that um, as well. Southeast Campus, and I'm talking about probably the, the, the property on Thomas and 101. 
Uh, we've met with uh, Grand Canyon University, met with EMCC and their president. Um, and I have a vision there for, again, thinking about how, how can we get students more opportunities while they're on campus. And it could be a trifold partnership where you have all three of us on one campus at one time. So the students, for an example, could, could attend us, they could attend GCU, they could attend EMCC all, all on, the, on the same campus at the same time. Again, this, these are just visions, things I want to explore to be able to bring back and see what might be possible. So we've, I've met with GCU, they're very excited about having the conversation. Uh, we've got another one that's coming up pretty quick to talk to, to their president. Actually, I'm gonna get a chance to talk with, with Brian again. And uh, we've already talked with EMCC, and so we're looking at what that might look like as a partnership. Because keep in mind, as fast as Buckeye is growing, there's already talk about doing this kind of a model in Buckeye because it's going to be a little further out there than most colleges and universities will be. So it might need to be something a little further out from the Southwest campus. And so I want to explore that as a kind of a one-stop shop. Uh, the partnership visioning, um, I've met with Agra Free, I've met with Tullison, I've met with Buckeye, I've met with um, Dysart. And we may be looking at a, at a potential model for uh, the academy. So for an example, you have uh, Banner Health that's coming in north of uh, Verado and 10. You have uh, Hans is the uh, Brazo uh, West um, is gonna be next to Palo Verde, which is just west and north of, I'm sorry, north and south and east of, good Lord, west and south of 10 on Verado, good Lord. I feel like the scarecrow. And so we're looking at what it might look like to create kind of a, a, a medical mecca in that area just to continue to, to provide that pipeline of, of medical professionals to those two hospitals that we know are going to be in desperate need. But it also may get us closer in proximity to be able to get more students there more often and eliminate some of the transportation barriers. But again, it's about proximity. It's about that geographic footprint. What's the, what are the needs in the area and how can we provide support? And again, this could be a partnership. So for example, we could partner with a district that may pass a bond issue or have additional funding. They may be able to build the building. We may be able to supply it with, with equipment. We may be able to lease that to ensure that we, we receive our funding. So there's some different models that we're going to take a look at of how we can partner more, more closely with our with our school district. Again, just thoughts and visioning around conversations I want to have, but I wanted you to make you aware of that. And then I've had a couple of uh, governing board members talk about the potential of us looking at a different corporate start uh, building an opportunity. And so I'm going to explore that a little bit. We know this building is not quite as efficient as it needs to be. It's not really user friendly. It's not really community friendly. Uh, so that's something that I want to move forward with and just take a look at. Again, you're not approving anything tonight for us to be a project. It's just Here's what here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'd like to do, and, and are you okay with us going out, taking this information, and bringing it back? I'm delighted to take a look at this. Thanks for bringing it to us. Uh, I can't imagine we could do enough AIT programs to take care of what's coming our way. But aren't we missing uh, the central campus or the one by the Glendale Airport? Uh, we have some land there, and I don't see any. There is. And, and what I'm saying here with the corporate start building, that could also be a consideration. I didn't leave them off, uh, not, not for a reason. It's just that once we start looking at what we might do with this building, it may also be included in as a part of, because they need parking. There's several things that Central Campus needs for sure. They need a place to be able to fly their drones. There's other things that Central Campus needs that may also be expanding there. But until I kind of get to that point of kind of what's going to happen with these three, then we can move forward to what we can do with the, the property that we have left on there. Well, I just. I don't need the answer today or yeah. what you're thinking, but uh, if we're globally looking at the district, then I would include that on here somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Corporate slash central class slash start slash. And if there are other things that you're thinking collectively as, as individual board members that you don't see up there that you would like for us to consider as we start looking at these options that are available uh, for us, be sure to let me know. I mean, let us know. What I worry about is building at today's cost versus building at five year, 10 year from now cost. And I know that we had some preliminary discussion, well, and we had some presentations about the Taiwanese factory and 100,000 homes going in from yeah. 303 all the way down to Bell Road. Um, you know, what, what's our thinking with land? Not, we don't need, you know, I'm not suggesting we're gonna do a, but I think we need, if we're globally looking at Westmac, land, facilities, and programs, then we should just even look to the future so that we save our taxpayers money. Absolutely. Uh, 
I, I think I, I think I finished it for Jared. Sorry about that, Jared. Nope. <laughs> um, let's see. Ahead. Yes, Mr. and then Mr. K. Okay. So uh, first of all, I really appreciate the presentation. I think actually that uh, this is exactly uh, what the board needs to see, and I wish it had come much sooner. So I'm really very appreciative of this because this is something I have hammered on since I've been on the board, and this is the first time that it's, um, I'm seeing something. So I really enjoy that, of, the, of this magnitude. What I would um, recommend, of course, the board has to. So I, I'm, I'm in all approval of this. So what I would recommend, uh, you know, as one board member, is that as you go out and you uh, collect these informations and do due diligence, is that you really put a, a priority a list together and that they're presented to the board in a modular fashion. So you, uh, right. in other words, so the next step, what are the priorities? Right. What do you guys see as the, or what does administration see as the priorities? What are the barriers of entries? You know, sort of like a SWOT analysis, right. you know, and, right. and right. this is what we should go after. And the only thing I would say, because, you know, I'm only a contracted, uh, a person, but I'm also on the Science Technology Board uh, for uh, CSET, the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology. And um, GCU has a way of harvesting ideas. They have uh, high degrees yeah, of capitalization and mobility and to ability to mobilize. So some things, uh, you know, I would just... Uh, Caution, if they're really spectacular, maybe don't give the full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, I... Understood. Um, uh, so, uh, I, you know, I'm not an official employee. I'm a, like I said, I'm a contracted associate adjunct. So, um, uh, but I think this is really good. I think that um, uh, I like it. Thank you. Mr. K. Yes, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for sharing and letting us in. Um, I'm not going to be here very long, so I have to throw all my <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, can come as a public. A notepad. year or so ago, we saw a presentation about remodeling the VET program at Northeast. Is that still it's, a thing? It's done. Oh, it's done. It's okay. Done. All right. Okay. Well, 99.9% um, .9 done. There's still a few little punch items, I think. Um, I love the ideas of the auto automation and, and the hybrid electric. I, I like both of those. Um, I have a concern about the automation one. It, it feels like we're setting ourselves up for failure. Not because it's not the right industry. Not because it's not a great thing to send students at. But I like if it's as growing as you say, how in the heck are we going to land a teacher? Right. Like whoever has the skills to teach it is worth three times as much doing it on their own without teaching it. That, that's just a huge concern of mine. Like, how in the heck are we going to be able to afford a teacher who knows how to do these things and isn't just doing it? That's one of the things I talked to Scott Holman when we met with him probably about six weeks ago, is he knows and recognizes that that partnership could include them providing us the person to actually be able to deliver the program in classes. Because it could also be, I will also talk to him about uh, a, a potential training site for continued training education for his own employees. And again, you're looking for those opportunities to be able to entice and to, to make those opportunities look better uh, for an individual to be able to say, listen, in order for us to do this, you're going to have to help us. A, a model I've heard about, I don't, I don't know that Westmex tried it. Maybe we have. Maybe Mr. Welsh remembers that we've tried it before. Um, you know, I have a teacher's heart. And, and teaching is an art. Um, all of us who've been a teacher in here know that, like, you might have all the content knowledge, but actually being able to build a relationship with squirrely teenagers and being able to tra track them and encourage them and move them forward, not everybody who knows how to do a thing <laughs> knows how to share the thing. Right. And then, and then to herd the the stray cats that are high school students. So a, a model idea might be to get a certified teacher in the room and then have all your technical skills things as 
month-long guest lecturer kind of a deal. So you have the IT guy that TSMC donates to us for a month, right? right. Or Palo Verde donates to us a month. Or who, whoever, right? Ford, uh, whoever's building batteries. Like, I don't know, whatever the industry is, some machinist plant, right? Elect, you know, um, Brazil's, you know, plumbing. And, and a guy comes in, and, or a girl, and they're, they're, they're rough in their industry, and they know the stuff, but they're not good at the kids. But they come in, and they give the content, and then, you know, it's sort of it's a, a team teach kind of a deal. There's a teacher of record. Alberti. There's the content expert. We could probably hold on to the teacher of record for a while, and then we just rotate in that that content person. I, I, like I don't know, I don't know what needs to happen with certifications, Mr. Welsh. I don't know how that looks, but like, man, I, I'm just thinking all these tech things and the way the the market's going. We're gonna like that's gonna be something we're gonna need to investigate. How the hell the heck are we gonna keep teachers in front of these kids yeah, so that point. we're not closing po programs just because of teachers? Because I, I think it's, it's absolutely the programs we need. How are we gonna land a teacher? That's a concern I have. <laughs> you're um, asking. You're asking a. You're asking the right questions, and so we're asking the same questions. Partnering with the industry, industry furnishes. Well, industry furnishes the content guy, and then we have a teacher yeah. of record that yep. that manages the class, does the paperwork, and grades things, and and makes sure that the kids are on the thing, and does the all the IPs, and but there's somebody else coming in with the content, so that we're we're ticking off both boxes because we have to be CTSO cert. We got to have we have to have those boxes. I don't know. And we've done this model with, um, so we've done this model, sorry, Stephen, in, in, uh, with uh, Palo Verde and our energy program in the very beginning. If you guys um, remember that Palo Verde supplied us with right. this, this very model, uh, Jim. It was that they provided a, a, a paid Palo Verde employee full time. So this was the, this is like the Cadillac scenario, but he really was full time at our campus. We had our own instructors there that they had their own expertise. Um, but he was right from industry there with us to be able to co-teach, provide that expertise to students and for, for three years, four years. And then he now works for us full time. He retired from APS mm -hmm. and then we hired him as a teacher yeah. for us. But so we've, we've, we've experienced that model. I think I agree with Dr. Spurgeon with some, with like a TSMC. I think we could get that they have as much of a need and the investment that I think we could get a similar model, yeah, whether it's but a full plumbing time. and electricians, like they're always saying, why aren't you personal? Like we can't land a teacher. I was just going to add uh, back to a conversation Dr. Spurgeon started with the evening with Parker and Sons. It is exactly <coughs> what Dr. Spurgeon, his leadership is doing with Parker and Sons, is we have HVAC teachers both at the high school and the adult level, but they might not have the breadth of industry experience that we want them to have. So through our partnership with Parker and Sons, Parker and Sons can, you know, for installation this month, this person's coming in from industry. For us to do, you know, other system maintenance, another person's coming in, all being coordinated under Dr. Spurgeon's leadership. Heat pumps versus or like in, like installation versus whatever, yeah. right? Exactly what you're talking exactly. about, Mr. Kaltenbach, okay. is um, are, are things that we are exploring. It's also how we operate our college programs with fire science. Fire science is very similar. Well, they'll bring in experts to teach certain units. EMT operates that way as well. So that is under Dr. Spurs' leadership. What we will do with uh, many of these programs, I believe. Now, when you do this, I I love this conversation do you create okay let's say that for the first year this outsider comes in and then you have the coordinator the other person do you create a lesson plan so that you know at the end the certification is going to be this and next year here's the plan yes so we create both at a uh, so throughout the program we create the all of these programs that we built, we create a, a scope and sequence, which essentially aligns the, the pacing of the curriculum throughout the, the whole program. That is aligned to that certification. So, and that that becomes consistent with industry feedback, with teacher feedback. We create those so that regardless of the teacher that comes in, that framework is there. And then that gets down to the unit level, and then down to the day to day lesson plan level um, that the teacher um, creates. So, so we create that framework and, and that's kind of what defines our curriculum for all of our programs. And then we use that teacher expertise to come in and, and, and deliver that. 
because, because we then you have something that can go on okay. to another teacher to another teacher. So that's correct. So your, I think your question, I just want to reframe it so I understand it correctly. This year, Miss Wiley's teaching the class. She creates a series of lessons plans during her prep time. She gets a half million dollar offer at the end of the year to go back to industry. She says, can you match it? And we say, sorry, we can't. So then you hire me the next year. We have her lesson plans, so I can use those lesson plans next year, and I don't have to recreate the wheel. Yes, and if you may not have the expertise in a particular area, at least you have a starting point. You have a, you have a lesson plan that you can do some more research on your end or bring it in industry. I, I at least know, hey, this is, this is the day-to-day -day plan, and I can keep a little bit ahead, so I'm not but I, totally I, I even see that the same scenario ha happening for existing teachers today that are here at West Mac or NCTE because we're, we're creating a certificate, but it'd be great to have a lesson plan for all of those certificates. There are. So yeah. there Every are. Every one of our program has lesson plans, yeah. They do. So that's what all that hire PD, teacher. we talked about those three-year PD have. thing, that was to teach them how to do that. So that's all done. You have to have. Yeah, it's required. Okay, so. That but that's a good idea. You're on the right page. Good job, Mark. Yeah. And we're housing that all with our new Canvas learning management system that we're piloting this year. We'll fully roll out next year. We're able to house that all in one place electronically so that it can live from teacher to teacher and be accessible from anywhere. And you can even collaborate a teacher at one campus and a teacher at another campus working in the same program can share true documents. All right, um, that was only my first question, sorry. <laughs> All right, hybrid electric. Um, my, my, uh, I, I, my school that I work at, we tried to get some, some programs in there and I will tell you that fire marshals are all on fire for this electric battery thing. They are, and so I, I'm just looking at the map and we're putting it in the back corner and I'm just like, they're gonna wanna have a 50 foot wide fire lane to get to that building if we put a bunch of electric batteries in there. So before we build the thing, we just need, we need every fire marshal in the entire city of Phoenix to be on board with that thing and get some blood oaths before that we build right. it. Right, and the fire marshal for the airport. Yeah, and the airport fire marshal board and the FAA and probably somebody from true. Andrews Air Force Base, I don't know. And Mr. Caldbuck, one of the things that we'll probably do first, it was um, recommended by our automotive advisory committee, is we'll start with hybrids versus going straight to the electric vehicles because there's still some safety. No, no, I, I get that from the teaching, yeah, thing, but like if but, you're gonna build a building, it's like, like they were wanting us to put in a separate fire stand, a whole fire stand, whole fire pipe in a new ex in an existing building, just dedicated to that, whatever you're going to do. So that's a thing. Yeah, as long as we know it. Yeah. Beforehand, so it's not after the fact. Ahead of time, like even if you're not going to do it right ahead, build yeah. that ahead of time. They need a lot of water to put out those battery fires. Yeah. Um, the academy thing, I. I I was thinking, is Shelly still here? Did she just escape? She's the person to ask. Uh, Shelly actually kind of like lived it, right? When we, she was at the cutting edge back in the day, you know, and kind of that remote campus deal. And and there was a bit where she, she was, you know, there was that like they were kind of out on a limb, all on their own, right? And so, so when we when we when as we venture down academies, and I'm not saying not to do academies, but there's lots of questions. Who owns, the, who owns the kids? Um, when we were when we first were at the cutting edge, Jack Jack started working for Westmac because we had conflicts and the the Maricopa Skills teachers didn't want to do the Westmac discipline procedures and and like it was a it was a whole thing, right, Jack? It was a central satellite. It's the same thing. It's just like we had at Ironwood, Stephen Ward with the other. He stepped out. They were always difficult with the supervision and the attendance because whose students were they? Right, the, the, and the attendance, and then like whose kids are they and whose rules do they have to follow and do they have to be here every day and can they go do this other thing and, and, and uh, right, so, so I'm not saying no, but I'm just telling you, right. we, we've got some people in the room who've, who've lived it and they're just, 
there's just a, a ton of little traps and pitfalls, right? And, and there is Shelly's back, right? The cutting edge, the cutting edge and the difficulties with with the kids belonging to someone else and who the teachers belong to and who they were really loyal to and and you know where that is. So so when we you know and then if if some other district builds the buildings, right? Like they're gonna want it. It's like it's their kids. And then they want to have an assembly. And it's like well, all right, that an assembly, but yeah, but now we're out. That's ours that we're not getting kids time in, you know. And so those are the kinds of things that that uh, you'd have to have really, really lined out ahead of time, right? Um, not that it can't happen and can't be great. You're right. You, you solve all the transportation issues and you kept cut all that out, but you just added new problems. And so those are all things that you'd have to. Yet yeah, you just you just got to have it because like we we stopped. We we even. Uh, we had the we had the uh, cosm cosmetology there at the Maricopa Center on on the 17, right? Right, and we and we were just fine. Like, like I don't remember exactly why we stopped that. Was it just too hard? We didn't have enough kids. Uh, it was the changing plans of legislation about having credit hours versus contact hours. Yeah. So those are those are all things mm -hmm. that that just to just to make sure that that it, you know I'm not going to be here to ask these questions. So got it. I'll throw them out there, because because right because like these are all things that, that that well Frank's been here for most of it, but we watched it happen, and we're like ah let's not do the same mistakes again, right? We're going to find all new mistakes because this is just the human condition, but right. like, let's find new mistakes, not keep making the same old ones. Um, so that's it. So thank congratulations on the vet deal. Um, yeah, I think these are I think this is great. I think bringing this to us ahead of time and saying this is what I want to want to go do. I think that's a, a great way to deal with it. Um, because then, like two months from now, when they say, when these guys say, well, well I don't remember that, it's like, no, no, remember, we showed it to you. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, anyone else? I have a question. Uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, thanks. I, thanks for the presentation. It does help a lot seeing it ahead of time. I have a question about uh, the, it looks like a parking lot. I'm looking at the Google view, and you can see it in the picture that you have here at the bottom right corner. Looks like parking space. Uh, are we reconsidering or repurposing that? That's that's a that storage order? for the vehicles for the automotive and the, 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 for the um, auto body collision. For the auto collision and the auto program. So that's yeah. Those are all the vehicles that our students work on, our mm -hmm. program vehicles and stuff, um, utilize that space currently. So it looks like there's a lot of empty space, but this is also an older picture. So. There's there's not a whole lot of empty parking like parking spaces in that in that area. It's full. It's full. Yeah, it's full. Every every day with vehicles. Both you have auto collision and auto tech right yeah. next to each other, and in between that is the parking for the vehicles that um, that they're working on. Is this corner here? This bottom corner? Because I know they're here. These two buildings. I'm talking about this corner. The short is that that's right next to yes yes exactly what you're describing all right. oh, okay all right thank you so on that map could you just tell it is auto where is auto body and auto tech compared to the green square so we do right here This is our. This is the Auto Tech building right here. This this is parking and storage for that building. There's a storage facility right here. So one of the they didn't highlight it very well. So one of the things we talked about potentially in the original plans was to to relook at this storage building here. There's some roofing and stuff that needs to be done so that it's more waterproof. Right now we can't really fully utilize some of this storage here um, in this space. This is all parking in between those buildings here. This is additional parking and then a storage. This is like a like a storage building right here that we're currently not utilizing because of it needs a few upgrades and so in that scope that I talked about um, as part of this building we would talk about exploring what would it take to to get this storage building up to speed to help um, help with the storage because there's not a huge land mass right here so we are going to need some some potential additional storage that we can utilize in that space there because you might be able to incorporate that into the new building and open more space on the side to park vehicles or some or other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And so you know this is the vet building right here. This is the one that just got remodeled. Oh, I think we talked about. And then this is the 
this is the model body. Mr. Guy, in the, put the park in the northern, just north of the auto, auto tech building, is that a mobile mini? By the, on the by right side, side, there's like a gray rectangle. Yeah, right there. That's, that's A1. That's the storage building. The storage. Actually, it's on the right. Okay. And who, who put stuff in there? Construction. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Miss, any more questions, Mr. Ramirez? No. Um, so I did have a couple. I had a, had a chance. A um, couple things. On the partnerships, um, just like industry is competitive and teachers are hard to retain, how do we maintain that partnership? Um, because people now move a lot quicker. So you're working with somebody, they're committed to the program, they leave TMSC, how do you get that new connection? And that's more of a watch out of right. the industry's changing. Um, and so it's more just um, how do we do that? Uh, and then on the Northeast campus, um, how is that building, and you, this is when you come back, but how is that building being utilized now? How it's first and second floor? And if we do do that, what is the disruption to those programs that are in there now? How do we address that? Because if you're having construction and a teacher's trying to teach, how do you make that happen? Um, and then we talked about the assembly space. How will that work if we're going to put a second floor and most assembly spaces are high because they need that? So how do we get to utilize that space and um, how often is it going to be used and is it worth having an assembly space if we only have a single floor? So those are kind of the things I'd want to hear when we come back. Um, and then finally, the thing that I, I heard you mention a little bit, um, would love to see in the plan is uh, you mentioned continuing ed. Um, there's a lot of industries that have continuing ed. It's a great way to introduce West Mech to a lot of industries. Um, real estate has continuing ed. Um, mortgage officers, appraisers, I think um, drones have continuing ed. How could we get into that continuing ed, even if it's just free using our buildings, why people conduct continuing ed, just to introduce them to West Mech, that might be another opportunity. So that's all things to maybe think about as part of the plan, but that's really my thoughts. But overall, thank you. It's great to see the vision um, down the road and see it formulate. Will we still be able to park our corporate jet in the hangar? <laughs> just check. We have too many airplanes out there. You can't get another one in there. And, and maybe that's the other question is, um, would we ever expand <coughs> aviation to Northeast Campus if it's so busy at Glendale? And would we be willing to give that up because we have a, a hangar now? Um, but those are all things, why or why not, and so forth. For sure. um, so somebody asked earlier about to bring back kind of the scope and sequence. I know the Northeast Campus, uh, these projects right here, and the AIT in Southwest, and then the uh, IT Security 2.0 are going to come back first, okay. probably in priority order. The other things are going to be more exploratory about what might we be able to do and some other opportunities to be able to collaborate with other partners in the area. But those three or four things are going to come back the first. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present. So hopefully you like the format. It will get better as, as time goes on. But I, I'm always a person that likes to make sure everybody knows kind of what we're thinking. And if we're not thinking right, then. You know what I, I like about it, and uh, other people can chime in, you talked about Northeast Phoenix because that's the priority, and then just a high level about the other campuses because that's exploratory. Yes. Perfect. It doesn't have to be a two-hour study session. It's a 20-minute conversation and 20 minutes of questions from the board. Exactly. So thank you. Um, so moving on, uh, 15 calendar of events. You can see everything. I think they already mentioned the think tank with Joel Wakefield. Yeah, we have to vote on this. Oh, I'm sorry. Make a motion that. I'll make a motion that we, um, um, let me let me get to it here. I have it here. Sorry, my, my mouse slipped. Sorry. I make a motion that the uh, board give approval to administration to move forward and gather 
uh, the necessary information and documents on uh, the potential West Mac campus um, and uh, collaborative projects as presented uh, uh, to be brought back to uh, the board. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Ramirez. Any more conversation? Hearing none, um, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Thank Any you. opposed? Yes, all right. Carry on. Thank you. Mr. Guy, where did he, did he leave? Oh, sorry. I didn't see it. He slipped. There's a podium okay. in the way. All right. Moving on, um, calendar events. You can see everything there. If you want to go to Think Tank or anything, let uh, D know so they can publish an agenda if needed. Um, Future agenda items. Anybody have anything? I already got my answer. Project search, but it's coming next month. Perfect. Anything else, anybody? Um, Ms. Markham, if you could get for the um, ASBA when that roll call thing would be done um, for breakfast, if we can get other board members there, that'd be nice as well. If we also need to set up another meeting. Right. Oh, I have that. Next week on Wednesday, we need to do a, a meeting to approve the minutes from tonight so that can go forward. Um, so we're looking at the 16th. It would be a Zoom meeting just to approve the minutes. Is there a specific time that works for everybody? 4.30 or? Of November. Next week. Next yeah. Mr. Chair, this is just a short meeting. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. going to be a Zoom meeting to approve the minutes. Okay. And we'll be done. Five minutes. It's fine. I'm going to break Mr. Kopbach's record of shortest meeting as well. <laughs> Minute 46, Mr. Craig. I, I think I can do that. Is that the challenge? I thought that was what it was. So are you, I, so are you like 4 o'clock or 4.30? I'm good with 4 o'clock. I'm good with 4. Everyone good with 4? Who was the date? Next Wednesday, the 16th. 16th. Mr. McLaren. By Zoom. Five minute West Mac. Uh, less than a minute 46. A minute 45 <laughs> second. Maybe. That included the pledge. It included the pledge, pledge and a moment of silence. Can I give you? Yep. Wait, we don't need the pledge. We don't need a moment you of silence. Do. It's a special you meeting. Do. Oh, no, you we do. don't. I, no, we don't. Just say it. We don't do them on special meetings. <laughs> and I can't beat a minute 46 if you have to throw in the pledge. We did the pledge. We well, did it we in did a minute not. 46. There's no way. I'm the, just the, the, the pledge takes a minute 46. Oh. And a moment of silence. Oh, no. Come on, Mr. Strzok. I'll be <laughs> All right. 4 p.m. next Wednesday. Ms. Markham, if you'd send out. All right. Hearing nothing else, I consider a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Mr. Kaltenbach. Second. Second by Mr. Ramirez. We stand adjourned till next week. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>